there you go. And she's starting to quiet down. Her breathing is lowered. There we go. I just made a new online course called How to Massage Your Own Dog. So I'm thrilled to introduce Daisy. Daisy's our pug here today. And this is Linda, the owner and parental guardian of, of Daisy. And how old is Daisy? Daisy is 13. So she's a 13-year-old pug. If you're confused, that's what she is. And have you been the original parent or yeah. was there other steps in between? No, I've had her since she was seven weeks old. Yeah. And when did she get diagnosed with pug myelinopathy? When she was eight. I'm eight years old, so about five years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And what, did, what were some of the things you were noticed in the beginning? Um, I noticed immediately a change in her gait, in her walk, mm -hmm. and in the rear. And um, particularly on the right rear side, I could hear she on the bare floor her foot drag up a slightly. And I have an animal background, and so I immediately had a feeling what this might be. So we, yeah, we had an appointment, we scheduled an appointment and got a diagnosis. Okay. Right after and, and remind me again, how many years ago was that? Um, when she was eight years old, now she's 13. So did I do the math right? Yeah. Five. <laughs> okay. And so it's interesting, a few, a few bullet points, and then in a second I'm going to go into a little bit more detail, so hang in there because I'm going to do a quick little tutorial on um, where I break it down a little bit more. But just in general, uh, the, the pug myelop myelopathy, trouble saying it today, uh, typically doesn't affect the front limbs. You'll see it in the back end. So the front limbs, limbs are normal. For most dogs, it's painless, so they're not going to be suffering pain from it. Um, you would see a change in tail height or tail carriage. So the tail carriage would be a little droopier and not as responsive because it's uh, knocked out the whole rear end. And, um, and it doesn't curl anymore. Right, so you see that tail change. Uh, another thing is uh, fecal or urinary incontinence. Did she ever experience that? She has that slightly. We're fortunate yeah. it's not full, yeah. but she does have that. And, and you know, across the world statistics, uh, typically there's a one to two year life expectancy after the diagnosis, unless, big unless, Linda's the mother because uh, with good handling and care and maintenance, you're very often uh, able to extend that. And you're now five years into a past yeah, your diagnosis and, and living yeah. a good life. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure you've also are very attentive yeah. uh, in your healthcare with uh, Daisy. And also, uh, Daisy also has some cool things too because Daisy hasn't completely lost her rear end. She's not in a wheelchair. Yeah. And uh, so, some good things came together. The right mom with uh, a dog that is getting through this pretty well. You also did acupuncture for years. For four years, we yeah. went to doggy acupuncture, yes. Yeah. And I'm not saying that everybody needs to do that, but, but there's sometimes ways to push the envelope. And um, I really just wanted this to be not about chiropractic because I can't change her, her diagnosis. So if you're watching going, oh, he's gonna do some adjustment and she's gonna change. No, you're watching the wrong video. I can't do that and I won't be able to do that. But I do feel like chiropractic care is part of wellness care. And sometimes I work in a crisis. A dog's hip is out and I, I work on getting that hip realigned to a place where it's not limping. Um, but with, uh, with a condition like this, she's limping all the time. She's dragging her back end. The right leg is more compromised. A good body head to toe gentle adjustment could only be part of a nice wellness uh, part of her day today. And let's just see, you know, if that just feels good and if it's open. I'm not going to overdo it. I know what level because I've worked with this before, what I can do and what I shouldn't do. So I'm not going to do anything traumatic or intense or severe, just enough to give her some general wellness today and, and give her a good experience. So that's it. So I just wanted everybody to know a little bit more about pug myelopathy, also known as pug dog encephalitis or PDE. It's a neurological disorder primarily affecting pugs, although we'll see uh, French Bulldogs, English Bulldogs, and also Boston Terriers sometimes get diagnosed with this. Um, it is believed to have a genetic component with a suggested autoimmune basis. Some of the symptoms 
that you'll see is you'll see the gradual onset of hind limb weakness, lameness, or paralysis. You're going to see difficulty walking or standing, a loss of coordination, also known as ataxia, pain in the neck or spine, that's where chiropractic can come in sometimes, urinary and fecal incontinence in later stages. Seizures may incur in some cases. The prognosis is generally poor, with most affected dogs progressively losing mobility and quality of life, and the rate of degeneration is different from dog to dog and case to case. The disease is typically fatal, with euthanasia often recommended to prevent suffering. So now let's take a look at some of the treatment options. There's no cure for pug myelopathy. Chiropractic can't cure it. Your acupuncturist is not gonna be able to cure it. Or your vet, nobody can cure this. Treatment is primarily supportive and aimed at managing the symptoms. Physical therapy and rehabilitation exercises may help maintain mobility for a period of time and is often recommended so your dog can have as long lasting of a life as possible during their circumstances. Remember, every dog is different. That's where sometimes chiropractic is recommended, not to cure it, but just to alleviate symptoms and to manage pain and suffering. Pain management medications can alleviate discomfort. Some vets may recommend alternative therapies such as acupuncture or hydrotherapy to improve quality of life. In severe cases, euthanasia may be the most humane option. So again, it's case by case. It depends how hard and how fast this hits your dog. And you have to work with your vet and figure out what your specific case will be and then make the best options under those circumstances. I hope this helped a little bit just to give you some ideas, some information in a concise way right here at once. Thank you so much. We're back and I just want to hit that one last point that we were talking about previously. Like Linda gets this diagnosis, right? And it was about five years ago. And a dog could have rapid progression from stage three to stage four, where it goes from partial paralysis to full paralysis, complete paralysis in a matter of a month or two. All the king's horses and all the king's men are not gonna make a difference because, but sometimes you can extend that window. You can stretch that opening a little bit better nutrition, look at the food, look at the healthcare. Is there anything else maybe you could add? Massage, alternative. Uh, you know, I made a course called how to massage your dog. It's on how to massage your dog.com, but you do your own body work. You get acupuncture. You might be able to extend that window. Maybe chiropractic care, uh, wellness chiropractic care could be part of your game plan. And then, like I said, other times there's nothing you can do. It, the door slams shut too fast and you can't do a thing. But in her case, she's got to have you know, so far five wonderful years of her relationship with this dog that got extended. And thank goodness, every day is precious. Well, I wanna check your cervicals first, and I'm gonna be up here at your neck, and you're gonna just hold on to the harness the whole time. You got it, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm up here at the, the base of the skull, at the atlas, where the base of the skull, the occiput meets, meets the atlas, and it is a little tight here, so I'm gonna just pull that down. So I'm getting on the right wing of the atlas. There you go. So that's a good little pull. Let me see the spacing now, it's much better. Let's check your range of motion all the way up. She's all a wiggly worm, She's so wiggly. sorry. No, it's okay, I'm so used to this. And Daisy pump. Good, so I see a little bit. I'm gonna use the activator instrument and I'm gonna do another spot here. And then I'm gonna come at the base of the neck at C5. There we go, that's a good one too. That even made a little click. I'm at the withers now, so I'm at T3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Dogs have 13 bones in their mid-back, 7 in the neck, like all mammals except manatees and sloths. And dogs have 7 lumbars. Us humans have 5, horses have 6. So it depends on the species. The thoracics and the lumbar will change number, but for almost all mammals, they have 7 bones in the neck, as I said, except the manatee and the sloth. So even a giraffe, this is interesting for you. Giraffe who has this big long neck has the same amount of bones that you have in their neck as you do, right? That's interesting. So I'm coming down the back now. I'm in the thoracics. And now that I'm in the thoracolumbar junction where T13 is meeting uh, L1, I feel this is where it's really locked up. And this is where maybe I can be of assistance today because I'll just open these up, mobilize them a little bit. I'm not gonna do anything big and forceful because it's a senior dog with a condition and I'm not gonna do anything foolish. That would be contraindicated, so don't expect something crazy because I'm not just going to do something that's inappropriate. And so now I'm cupping the spinous with my finger and my thumb and just kind of springing the joint 
this is the type of and look, and now she's almost settling she into likes this. It. Yeah. Feeling good. There's a technique in, in human chiropractic called motion palpation. Palpation means to touch with with focus. So it's not just touching aimlessly, but it's getting in knowing where you are. I'm on each spinous. I'm also on the angle of the spinous, so it's 60 degrees or 90 degrees or 45 degrees. And I'm following the angle of the facets as I go through the disc plane and the facet angles and I'm just mobilizing these joints and I'm looking for the one that's not moving so well. So I'm back up at T13. By the time I hit L1, it's stuck. So here's one, there we go. And here's another at L2, good. And I'm coming down lower, L3 feels fine, L4 feels fine, and here's five is fine, six is not, six is stuck. So now I'm gonna, Again, I'm on the angle. Notice my arm. So my arm is creating an angle. Like I'm not doing it like this. I'm doing it like this. And that's how I was taught by my veterinarian teachers that were animal chiropractors that taught me this technique. But we learned this in chiropractic school for humans too, that the angle is very important. And it's the line of thrust, the line of correction it needs to be very specific. So a lot of times people will watch this and go like, oh, I can do that at home, but do you really know all the angles of every species that you're working on? You should, because you don't want to clack those bones together. You want them to slide correctly. And look, she's calmed down. Did you notice her breathing? Mm -hmm. So even though I'm not doing big thrusts, I'm working through the joints, mobilizing the joint with a motion palpation technique, and she's starting to quiet down. Her breathing is lowered her respiratory rate, her breaths per minute is coming down to a more gentle, calmer space. And now I'm all the way at L7. And just below this is the sacrum, and then we're off the lumbar spine or into the sacrum. So that junction is called the lumbosacral junction. And she's a little tight there too at L7. So I'm cupping the spinous at L7. I feel more on the left side, so I'm gonna to go to the mammillary process of L7. So I'm not even on the spinous anymore. My thumb is making a contact on the left side mammillary process. And I'm gonna just do a little bit of an adjustment there. Oh, she's wincing there, because that one hurts. There we go. Nice, thank you, Daisy. Good, so now I'm gonna back it up with a little tap. And now I'm going to sacral base posterior. And again, working through. So she's giving me a lot today. So I'm gonna feel the ribs next. Feel her thoracic cavity. You know, I'm rubbing her neck muscles now, her shoulders, and now I want to get on that right hip. So now I'm going to reach under her, and I'm going to bring her right leg back into extension. And she's got really good range of motion, which is nice. I didn't expect that from a senior dog. Bring her leg forward. And one of the things we're going to do is we're going to put these knuckles down. And do you see how her knuckles stay down? Can you see from your side? Absolutely. Yeah, so that's not good. Mm -mm. That's called... Um, appropriate receptive response, they should get a message that I just messed with their foot and put it in a weird position, and they should go like this and flip it really fast. But she does, she's not getting any signal to that foot, so that's a failed appropriate receptive response. It's now been five seconds, 10 seconds, it's still not being corrected. So she doesn't get a good mark on that. No offense, uh, I'm not making fun of you, Daisy. And here's the left side. The left side, she's feeling a little bit better. Do you guys see that? She picked it up twice. She still didn't correct it, but she's trying to grab it. Do you see that, Linda? Clearly, the right is the worst side, Yeah. right? She's been and you can there. see that in her walk when yeah. we show you the walk. She does the hula yeah. when she walks. What do you mean, like? Yeah, she does, Yeah, that's what she does. She does the hula. She does the hoops. She does. She's a hula dog. <laughs> All right. I'll show you my hula hoop later, OK? <laughs> so let me do a little adjustment into your hip now. And I'm gonna be up at the femoral head. And now next in the SI joint. Hold under here just a little so she doesn't fall. Mm -hmm. She's a really sweet dog. She is lovely. I don't know if everybody noticed, but she is wearing a string of pearls today. And I think that's a big deal. When you go to the chiropractor, you should dress up. That's right. We don't leave and the house without our pearls as yes. gals. And I, and I did notice that. And I do appreciate it a lot. So I'm going to leave the leg back a little bit, maybe even put my leg under just to hold it, okay? So I'm going to hold your leg up like this, 
and come in there. And let's go with my thumbs this time. There we go. Did you hear that click? Yeah. Okay. Let's check the back left. She does have nice flexibility. And I know that you're listening and you're probably watching, and if you know a little bit about animal care, you'll say, yeah, you're feeling the flaccidity. Of course I am. But with an older dog, you could have a combination of flaccid and also adhesions and tightness. So I'm not missing the point that she's going to have flaccidity, flaccidity, flaccidity in the rear limb, but you'll also find ligament restriction sometime and some contracture not contracted, but contracture, where it's locked up. And you'll see that with sometimes people you might know that have uh, cerebral palsy or some type of palsy where their fingers are curled up and they, you can't unfurl them. So here holds for a second. And so you just can't open their fingers. So sometimes we'll see a combination where, yes, the muscles are limp and flaccid, but there's still some contracture. I didn't see that on, on uh, Daisy. I want to freshen up the lower back with some impulses and then we'll finish there, okay? Mm. So this is a percussive instrument. It, it beats mm -hmm. 13 times per second. Okay. And I'm going to just come up through the lumbars, through the thoracolumbar junction. And this will just basically undulate and spring the joint a little bit and give it some motion. It's very light setting. Here, feel it on you. Mm. Not bad, right? Mm -hmm. You can feel it, but it's not painful or anything. I like that. And notice she's not yelling. No, or, no. Jesus, that's good. We like that. And I'm just going to come up and give this whole spine some motion. If I did this on you watching, you would love it. you go, oh my God, do mm -hmm. my neck yeah. and shoulders now. And let me do <laughs> C1 across the posterior arch of C1. There you go. That one is a little more vibratory. When you do it to people up in the neck, you'll feel like your nostril hairs are vibrating. <laughs> it's a funny experience. So we are done. Let's put her on the floor. Let's get her. Oh, let me do one last thing on the lower right. And then we'll just see her okay. do whatever she does, see if she wants to shake out. We'll be her out. Here's a shake, that's always good to see. So what I love is that she still walks, you know? It's, it's incredible. Yeah, which is really a miracle in itself. Yeah. Yes. So I promised Hula, let me see if I can do it. I don't practice enough. <laughs> but she's got Hula hips, so Hula hips, so I'm gonna try to. Hopefully you give me more than one, more than one take. One more time. It's good for the core. Not many people can do that our age <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I'm impressed. All right, that's all I can do. I'm that's embarrassed. Lovely. So we both have hula hips. So please leave we know we came Daisy a comment. She reads all our comments, or she will now, now if she's on YouTube. And thank you for watching today. I hope you learned something. And, you know, um, I'm just trying to do some good work and also teach people about some stuff maybe they haven't seen yet in the animal world. So thanks for watching. And she's starting to quiet down. Her breathing is lowered.